Good afternoon, Opportunity Nation. Thank you, and thank you, Mark Edwards, for the important work you are doing and for including me in today's conversation. I'm honored to be with you. We hear a lot during election seasons about American exceptionalism. To me, what's exceptional is that we are the only nation in human history not organized the way nations are normally organized. We're not organized around a common language or religion or even culture. We're organized around a handful of civic ideals. And we've identified these ideals over time and through struggle as equality, opportunity, and fair play. For this, more than anything else, I submit, we are the envy of the world. Opportunity is central to the American dream. That notion that in this country you can imagine a better future for yourself and your family and then reach for it. It's the dream of pilgrims who came to the American wilderness in search of religious freedom, of immigrants who fled oppression in search of a chance to prosper and still do today, of your parents and grandparents who scraped and saved so you wouldn't have to struggle as hard as they did. It's my story, too. I grew up on the south side of Chicago in the 50s and the 60s, most of that time on welfare. Who's here from Chicago? I lived with my mother and my sister and various other relatives who came and went in our grandparents' two-bedroom tenement. My mother, sister, and I shared one of those bedrooms and a set of bunk beds. So you'd go from the top bunk to the bottom bunk to the floor every third night on the floor. I went to big, broken, overcrowded, under-resourced, sometimes violent public schools. My guess is that the opportunity index for that neighborhood in those days was not that good. There were a lot of things we didn't have, but one thing we did have was a real sense of community. Because those were days when every child was under the uh, jurisdiction of every single adult on the block. So if you messed up down the street, if you messed up down the street in front of Ms. Jones, and she'd go right upside your head as if you were hers, and then call home, right? So you got it two times. There was a lot of emphasis on individual responsibility and hard work, but those adults also wanted us to understand that a community is about seeing your stake in your neighbor's dreams and struggles, as well as your own. I was influenced by my grandfather's work ethic, my mother's determination to get her GED, get off welfare, and get a job, my grandmother's faith. I felt the high expectations of the old ladies in church and the teachers in our segregated schools. And though no one in my family had ever been to college when I graduated from Harvard College in 1978, I know how lucky I was to be in a family where no one ever told me I couldn't all of that was vital for me then, just as it is for children from such neighborhoods today. But it was not enough. When my family was broke, food stamps helped us eat. When my sister needed her teeth fixed, a subsidized dental program provided it. There were well-prepared, dedicated, fully engaged teachers, even in our dilapidated public school, who helped us imagine what it might be like to become a citizen of the world. Individuals are responsible for the hard work, discipline, sacrifice, and mental and physical toughness necessary to excel. But a community helped me emerge from the south side of Chicago to law school, to the executive ranks in Fortune 500 companies, and to the Massachusetts State House today. And sometimes, sometimes, Sometimes that community is called government. Now, I don't think that government can or should undertake to solve every problem in everybody's life. But it does have a role to play in helping people help themselves. And I submit that we will never let opportunity flourish, especially for poor and marginalized children until we stop trivializing the role of government and start focusing on what government can and must do well. <laughs> government, government, after all, is just the name we give to the things we choose to do together. 
This is actually not a new idea in America. Americans rarely leave anything that we believe is really important entirely to chance. When we decided that settling the West was important, we created land-grant programs and built the Transcontinental Railroad. When we decided that educating our children was important, we developed public schools and universities. When we decided that liberty for all was important, I mean really important, we freed the slaves, gave women the right to vote, and sometimes even went to war. We tend to shape our own future in this country, not just let it happen to us. And in each case, government helped create opportunity. We built the greatest middle class in the history of the world in the second half of the 20th century, with hard work and ingenuity, yes, but also with the GI Bill and the interstate highway system. A generation of Americans have lifted themselves out of poverty with the help of Pell Grants and government institutions like the University of Michigan and Florida A&M or Roxbury Community College. My point, my point is that a lot of current political rhetoric about government is self-defeating. It's hard to create more opportunity when many want to fundamentally undermine the tools that have successfully created opportunity in this country for centuries. In Massachusetts, like everywhere else, we were hit hard by the global economic collapse. In state government, we cut programs and thousands of jobs. But even when the bottom was falling out of the rest of the state budget, we funded the schools at the highest level in the history of our Commonwealth. We doubled the investment in infrastructure. We expanded our investment in innovation and in research. And by the way, the Obama administration helped with every single one of those. And because of those investments, because of those investments, we are growing nearly twice as fast as the national growth rate. Our innovation economy is on fire, and we are first in the nation in student achievement. Why do this? Why do this during a recession? Because if you really believe in creating opportunity, you can't tell a second grader she has to sit out the second grade until the recession is over. You don't tell someone with a great idea for a new transformative company that those jobs can wait until the amorphous market feels like hiring again. It's silly to believe that government can do it all, but it's equally silly to limit the contribution government can make and has always made in building a stronger national or, in our case, statewide community. At the, um, at the Democratic National Convention earlier this month, I told a story about the Orchard Gardens Elementary School in Boston. Thanks to an infusion of new ideas and tools and a little new money, this once chronically underperforming school is in the midst of a profound transformation. In less than a year, proficiency measures at Orchard Gardens improved 70%, less than a year. The school has gone from one of the worst schools in the district to one of the best in our state. At the end of my visit a year and a half ago, the first grade, led by a veteran, wonderful, loving teacher, gathered to recite for me. First, they presented a poem to multicultural tolerance, and I started to applaud, and the teacher said, not yet, Governor. And then they proceeded to recite most of the I Have a Dream speech, Dr. King's incredible peon to justice. And I started to applaud again, and the teacher said, not yet, Governor. And then she started to ask those six and seven-year-olds questions. She asked them, um, what does creed mean? What does nullification mean? Where is Stone Mountain? And as the hand shot up to answer her questions, I realized she had taught the children not just to memorize, but to comprehend, to comprehend what they had recited. There are some nowadays who tell us that those first graders are all on their own, on their own to deal with their poverty, with ill-prepared young parents, maybe who speak English as a second language, with an under-resourced and all-around depressed public school with neighborhood crime and hopelessness, with no access to nutritious food and no place for their mom to cash a paycheck, 
with a job market that needs skills they don't have, with no way to pay for college. But those Orchard Gardens kids should not be left on their own. If we are to be a national community with common cause and common destiny, then we must see those children as our children too, yours and mine. And among them are the future scientists, entrepreneurs, teachers, artists, laborers, engineers, and civic leaders we desperately need. For this country to rise, they must rise. And we have a common stake in that. We have a common stake in their equality so we make the schools work better for all children. We have a common stake in their opportunity so we make ways for them to get the training and higher education they need to participate in and to shape the innovation economy of tomorrow. We have a common stake in assuring that the systems by which they are measured and held accountable are fair, that the playing field itself is level. We work for good government because good government makes these things possible. We do it because faith in the American dream still defines what it means to be America. The part I left out of the Orchard Garden story when I told it at the convention is this. This past February, 21st graders from Orchard Gardens arrived in Washington on what was, for most of them, I think, their first flight on an airplane. They went to practice reciting the I Have a Dream speech one more time, this time in front of that glorious new monument to Dr. King on the National uh, on the National Mall. Later that afternoon, they, along with that loving teacher and their bashful principal, went to the White House to recite for the President of the United States. Watching them run around the South Lawn, burning off nervous energy while they waited, or gawking at the unfamiliar splendor of the interiors, or asking where the bathroom is, or staring in bug-eyed disbelief when President Obama entered the diplomatic reception room. They could have been any six or seven year olds. And yet I'm certain that they felt important that day simply because someone made them feel worthy. Worthy. It was extraordinary that that someone was the President of the United States. But what matters most is that someone made them feel worthy. Someone. They could have been any six or seven-year-old. Yes, they should be every six or seven-year-old. The American dream belongs to them as much as to you and me. It's worth fighting for. It's worth investing in. It's worth sharing responsibility for because it is still central to who we are. Thank you for your work. Let's get this done. Thank you very much.